drifted alarmingly in the bedding was, you know, fancy in the morning it continued to drift. It was laid on the on the exchanges to, to lose. It was something you'd see in a, in a Dick Francis novel, Charles Bones. The ground is soft, it's not, it's oh, not. it's heavy. Soft on time, so it's, it's, it's heavy. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Vastures Inquiry. It's the Sunday Sermon. Yes, crackerjack of a show this week. Plenty to talk about, including reviewing the Breeders' Cup. We've got affordability on the horizon. Loads of developments there this week. And to chew the fat with all these interesting topics, John and Chris. Good evening, chaps. Good evening and bollocks to it all. That's my <laughs> message for the week. Bollocks to everything and everyone. Yeah, it feels like that. Really. The game yeah. feels like that right now. We keep we keep fighting the good fight. But, John, how was your weekend? Any good? Yeah, it was up there with my dad dropping dead Christmas Eve. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at that. Fucking Jesus. Yeah, and that orphanage burning down, eh? Yeah, fucking hell, John. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, happy Christmas. <laughs> we go on to the review then for yesterday. We might do touch on Friday a little bit as well, but there's just one race I want to touch on in the UK that I thought is worth touching on, and that was the defeat of last year's Gold Cup second Brave Man's game to the Irish challenger Mouse Morris's Gentleman's game. John, did you did you see that race? I did, yeah. I just thought to myself, that's a good start for the UK. I mean, it is, but there's been a lot of criticisms for the ride given on. Brave Man's game, Harry Cobden not going for it sooner and putting the race to bed before the going long at the last and making the bad mistake. Is, is, that a, is, that, is that a possible excuse for getting beat? Or do you, like me, think that he'd nothing left in the tank anyway? Well, I think in them conditions, you want to be hanging on to as long as you can, to be honest. Oh, mm. I think it's a bit ash blaming Cobden for... For that, you know, it was it was fifty fifty. I think it was impossible to say whether he'd have hung on. I mean, that that, that all seems to me as a sort of untutored idiot. I think it's a bit of a bridal horse, but you know, I I think it, I think it's really difficult to say. I think it's a genuine flip of a coin as to whether it'd have won or not. I think the problem with national hunt racing, and as we've seen for the last, I'd, I'd say about five years now, it's very difficult punting really good horses, grade one horses early in the season because you don't know how cherry ripe they've got them. You don't know what the plan is, i.e. did Cull say to Cobden at any point if you feel you be just look after it, that kind of or or don't like John says, don't go for it in a finish. The thing is the last consideration is punters, isn't it, John? Oh absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean uh, for me, really, I mean <coughs> I would tend not to have a serious bet of the sticks with other Hennessy. You summed it up in private chat, you know, betting fat horses, jumping edges. You summed it up again today, I think, or yesterday, when you said, have you seen the state of this lot? Fucking wind ups and well, edge yeah. gear. <laughs> you know, tongue ties. What's going to improve? It's... And that's just the trainers, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The, the reason why I'm, I've never been a, a total fan of a national racing is, is is for that reason, that there's always a target with these trainers and owners. And I don't blame them because it's a tough sport. Like you, you've you probably got only like a couple of goes a season before the, the, you know, they've yeah. had enough. If you run six times in a year or six times in national, you've done well. So you've got a couple of opportunities at, at most. So I get it why they have to, why they do it, but. It's it's very difficult for punters to read. I feel you can only hang on really to bet with confidence. You just need to hang on till Chelsea and you in match. And you do really maybe have a yeah. go. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, I suppose that's why people do get excited for Cheltenham in a way. But I mean, I I don't get it anymore because the books now shorten the odds like ridiculously. They go non runner no bet from a long way out, so they can go short odds on everything and i just think punters are taking terrible prices in like january february and it's it's often a better price on the day uh, it's so just, inspiring it's grim this show already isn't it? <laughs> full, full of cheer it gets better it doesn't but anyway <laughs> we'll carry on criticizing the state of the game later in the show but there's not really a lot else to discuss on saturday the flat racing at new market was neither here nor there so we're going to move on to the breeders cup Friday evening, 
saw a bit of controversy, John, where we had the withdrawal of uh, Breeders' Cup juvenile turf favourite River Tiber on vet advice. Well, not vet advice, as in you ain't running, Sunshine. I was very pleased to see Aidan win that race because I thought he took it like an absolute trooper. You know, I think his comments were, you don't go to Rome and have an argument with the Pope. Which is fair <laughs> enough. And I, I was pleased to see that they won that race because I, I thought that was... It, it, I mean, an hard, hard decision to take, as as was for Jesse Harrington, their arse taken out. I mean, it wasn't like she had a, a busting team, really. It was like a pram hook for God knows how long at the Raiders Cup, wasn't it? And, the decorum, I think, of Aidan O'Brien, he's, he's like a world, he's not only a world class trainer, he's a world class gentleman. He even humours the likes of Matt Chapman, you know, for interviews. And, you know, unlike Stout, who can't yeah. have a bar of him. He is a class actor as a man, isn't he? He's a, he seems like a really nice bloke, doesn't he? When you try and sort of like dislike someone because you not because I'm richer than you, yeah, I know. I yeah, know no, 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 because <laughs> cause it's like Coolmore and Godolphin, isn't it? You always want the little man to win rather than the big boys. Well, I do anyway. Uh, I, I always think uh, David and Goliath kind of uh, winning a horse race is really good to see. Like Adam West with with the Nunthorpe. We'll get on to Adam West in a minute. But I was I was really pleased for Aidan, like John, that he, he managed to win that race. So, But it was, it was an interesting thing. John, what's your view on that? Because Adele was going berserk at the way they were trotting him up with the gaps in the mat. It was a crazy setup. Um they showed it, and it, I mean, it just wasn't even, you know. I mean, they could have put a wrong step in. They could have gone there and they trot up, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> they could have actually lamed them. <laughs> right. This brings me on to another point. Should even Santa and Eater be holding Breeders' Cups? Because clearly this was overzealous, in my opinion. Oh, I'm not a bear. And I... the cells, weren't they? Yeah, they've had a lot of deaths at the track over the over the years, and I just think it was probably a little bit bit overzealous to put it this way. I mean, I'm sure that Aidan O'Brien would know or have a good idea if his horse was lame or not. He'd have enough people on the ground there to give a second opinion on that. And like you say, he took it well. But I think if you're that nerved up to let horses run at Santa Anita, then you shouldn't be having Breeders' Cups there, John. Agree entirely, Lee. I don't think the game needs the added pressure of a go like a a, tr- a a track that might cause a real negative impact on the sport. Hosted something like this, you know, which I don't know, maybe rolls out most of the tracks in America because they're all like <laughs> sources, aren't they? But you, you know what I mean? If, if there's one there with a particularly bad record for carnage. I think you would expect the their equivalent of the bit. Well, I, I'm just answering your own question there. I was going to say that you'd expect their equivalent of the BHA. You know, you wouldn't, would you? If they have if they have an equivalent of the BHA, you'd expect inertia. <laughs> so, but you would hope that the powers that be would say, "Hang on a minute, we're not going to run this here because you're all shitting yourselves." Why? You know. Absolutely. Right, so coming on to the ground on the turf, which was really quick for the weekend, on Saturday we saw a, an exceptional turn of foot which got Frankie de Tori out of jail, in my view, with in spiral in the turf mile. Well, Philly and Mare turf, sorry, over 10. And for me, that was in spiral's best ever performance to do that. In fact, that was the sharpest turn of foot I've seen. And in fact, I have not heard of any complaints from trainers Saying that that ground was unsafe or not happy with not happy with it. The thing is, I mean, they, they know they get going to get firm ground nine times out of ten when they go to a Breeders' Cup. Yeah. Um, secondly, even the likes of Mister Gosden, who obviously uses superior class to talk down to anyone in the game, can't get any change out of a. Yeah. Race course manager over there and get them put any water on, so I wouldn't waste the breath. 
You've nailed it. Exactly. They don't say anything because they know it's no, there's no point in saying anything because their opinion holds no no weight over there. It proves because we, we saw some really good turf racing and it sent fair. It, you know, you could come from off the pace, you could make the running or be handy. It just sent a really fair track, despite it's obviously difficult nature in terms of sharpness but master of the seas won from stall 14 so so it's not a case of like oh you can't win from out there it it, it, it happened to play out rather well I, I thought and this is the annoying thing that we've single-handedly as a sport ruined the game on the turf and you can see it this autumn yes we've had a lot of rain i don't i, I and we've had abandonments i i, I get that but there's a reason why these tracks are, are underwater and that that's simply because They've been hammering the taps all summer. We've never had them abandoned like week before and things like that, have we? I mean, it's the case of Donny. I mean, Donny have, have played a bit of a crafty one, really. Now, I know we said on the other week's show that Donny should have um, moved the Racing Post trophy probably to, to guarantee two days. But the, the problem is for me, this is too soon, John. I, I, I think they're doing this to guarantee the media rights money. Yeah, I think so. I, th- I think they're making sure that they're going to get it because... To me, this is way too soon. In fact, they're telling lies because the, the clerk said that they were due a, a possible 75 mil next week when the forecasts I read says about 10. Yeah. So I, I just think there's, it's lies and, and I think that's you know justification for them switching that. But look, and I feel sorry for the on-course bookmakers that you know it's their livelihood, the pitchers at Doncaster, and obviously they... That's it, you know. They can't, they can't turn up and earn a living. It is what it is. Uh, I think it's too soon, but fair play. We we did moan last week that they didn't weren't proactive enough, but I think this is probably possibly too soon. They could have at waited. Least maybe... a, at least we we guaranteed in a November handicap run on a decent surface for the first time in about twenty eight years. Yeah, USA yeehaw breads and Australian yeah. breads for artificial yeah. surface. Yep, yeah. no slot beasts. For Newcastle, that's what's going to happen next week. We're going to see the November handicap on an artificial surface up at Newcastle. So looking at Saturday then, John, uh, obviously we talked about Inspiral and the super turn of foot. And I want to see more of that on British race, on British race courses. I want to see horses absolutely fly on that ground, on that quick ground. And... No, I don't. I bet the fucking second. So I don't want to see that every day. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be a, yeah, there were a lot of long. Uh, John, I know you were on the second as well. You were sweet on that, and uh, you know it, it, it was painful. But it's it's still a spectacle in terms of what flat racing is about. That brilliance that you know you only get brilliant horses doing that. Mies used to do it when she went over there. That sparkling turn of foot that you see on fast ground. It's nice to see for the neutral, of course, not if you're Chris. Um, we go on to I want to look at Breeders' Cup turf, John, over the twelve. August Day Road, and now we've had a couple of people suggest that Ryan Moore was let up the inside, and um, you know that's the reason. No, he let him anywhere. Let's nail that once and for all. I mean, it wasn't the fastest run heat of the night by any stretch. They were really trapping going into that home turn. That was about as tight. The leader took about as tight as a line as he could have took. The fact was that Augustine Rodan was still on the bridle and Ryan was able to manoeuvre him round because he was travelling that much better than the one that led him into the stretch. He, he virtually cantered to the front. Would you say that was Augustine Rodan's best performance? No? Yeah, no, no. far and away. He, he rubbished him. So that puts that to bed. He did say on the preview pod that he'd enjoy the quick conditions and I think, to be honest... Like with the in spiral job. If Coolmore keep August Day Road on in trading, I'd be tempted to go to the US more often with him. Yeah, you just win everything over there, wouldn't you? Really? Yeah. <laughs> S- same with Inspiral. I mean she'd just yeah. she'd win she'd win every single race she ran interest in that. But you have to run after June, I think. It's just no good no good in spring. Don't come to hand. But uh, yeah, so I mean, on the whole, I thought Santa Anita did okay because it's firm ground, and the, the fact there's no trainers complaining or British trainers complaining annoys me as well because it's like, well, you complain like hell over here if it's, you know, and then we end up with a July course. Uh, in fact, I saw somebody the other day, John, say to Michael Prosser, who announced his retirement, that he's got a job at Surf Tracks and say, oh, you will be missed as you were one of the better ones in the game. Absolute covers. Um <laughs> 
And I mean, if a turf tracks to give him a job, that tells you where we're at, really, doesn't it? Well, if, if, if turf tracks with their record keeper can't see that the July course at Gilmark has just been systematically ruined and they still give the man that's done the ruination a job, well, where are we? Well, this is it, though, right? Is this in the interests of racing's rulers and big court to have nice, fast ground? Because we saw from the results from 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 Santa and Eater, and we see it before. Like that's why in the summer you, you tend to get settled form on fast ground, right? Is is that what's because the deal that the BHA have got with the books, as in they want punters to lose to fund the sport. Is is this is the fast grounds not in their interest? Is it? I don't know. They did all right out those lot. We could end up funding the sport. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Be, be single handedly. Yeah, a blank um, for us on. Yeah. Well, I think it sounds terribly end up here on our sort of thing. I'm going to say it anyway. I think there was a tendency on some of our parts at the weekend to maybe overthink things a little. Yeah, I'd go with that. Regarding post positions and how races might pan out, rather than just say, oh, that's the best of that fucking win. The people who did that, it's fair off, you know. And I really hesitate to call those deep thinkers, but I think the overthinkers ended up getting it shoved up their ass. <laughs> <You know? laughs> This is it. When you're out of form, you overthink, and that's it. I mean, Master of the Seas, I'm adamant, would have gone off like even money if that had, you know, been drawn towards the inside. So obviously, you gain compensated a nice price because it's well, over the years. I've had that many arses got shafted in the Raiders Cup now with a double figure draw. Mm. I, I just couldn't have it, you know. No. And yet, from turning in, there was only going to be one winner. So it was still the. Joe would press the button. He was always going to get there for me. But couple of listeners' uh, questions and points. Bert Donny says an Irish horse running his third ever chase beats arguably our best chaser. We're in trouble, aren't we? Yes, Bert. Yeah. We are. <laughs> As always in the national scene over our, our Irish counterparts, um, cruise control not being withdrawn from its second preference race until eleven thirty eight. A mere a one and a half hours before it was due off. Not to mention the bookies cutting his price to make a bigger rule for. I saw that. That was Tom Lacey's on Saturday. Uh, entering two races, John. And they didn't withdraw till 11.38. Why 11.38 when they know everything's on? Oh, I wasn't excited. That's terrible. Because no one could bet on them. Surely. Yeah. Because you're getting two rule fours. If you bet on one race that it's in, you get a rule four on that. And if you're betting in the race he's actually running in, you're not at any edge at all. I mean, it's terrible for the one that the race he got withdrawn in. I think it's disgraceful. I, I really do. I think I think Tom Lacey needs to answer some questions why that was drawn at 11.38. It should have well, been... I, a... I, 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 don't, I don't even think questions. I think just, you're fine, Tom. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a Barstow's exclusive because it might have been mentioned elsewhere. If it has, if it has, I apologise, and it's perp news. But Giggins Town, that my the disgraceful Michael O'Leary taking his horses from Henry de Bromhead and put them all with Gordon Elliott. Good God. Hmm. Poor Henry. He's had a tough time, obviously, and now he's I've, lost. I've, up. Seen, a, I've seen a TikTok this week of somebody uh, custard pain O'Leary. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this man has a, has a history of bad takes. I mean, this is the man that deprived the National Hunt fraternity of Tiger Roll equaling the fate of Red Rum because he got he, he, he threw his dummy out and said it's got too much weight. That in itself shows you what kind of man this is. It's it, it's like... Quack, the word you're looking for, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He runs a cunt of an airline, Ryanair. I mean, Jesus Christ. They've ripped us off before. They've probably ripped everybody off. In fact, everyone that listens to this podcast, you've probably been ripped off by Ryanair at some point. Except you, except you, John, you don't fly. And wisely so. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. Right, next point of conversation, we come on to Tony Calvin. And yeah. there was a big Ferrari this week as Big Turn decided to wipe PL, like you do. Yeah, yeah, nothing to see here. Obviously, there was, that was outrage from certain people on Twitter. I've got to be honest, I wasn't that bothered. He can do what he wants for me. It's not, 
I'll bring in Chris here because John loves Big Turn. Chris, yes, can you give me your thoughts on Calvin doing that, please? I thought it was shocking. I thought in the in the climate we are, where you know responsible gambling, we're being being shoved that down our throat. This is the man who presumably is paid to provide this advice, uh, hasn't been particularly successful, and said, "Oh, well, let's forget about all the losses now and start again." I mean that 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 runs contrary to the. A whole kind of message about responsible gambling and keeping records. And, you know, he's basically said, let, let, let's forget the fact that I've done my bollocks over the last 12 months. The only sort of saving grace is, I mean, who the fuck follows him anyway? So I think it's, it's kind of it's a kind of a moot point, isn't it? Because I don't think anybody actually follows his advice. But that's rubbish. That really is rubbish. You know, if, you, if you're tipping horses and getting paid for it, win, lose or draw, you stand up and, and, and you, you, you account for your, your losses and your, and your winnings. I think that's dreadful, personally. Yeah, I didn't get. I mean, not that it bothers me, but I just didn't. No, really, it doesn't. I, I didn't get the take. There's one thing we do as bar stewards, for example, we we do the naps table, don't we, and put that up. And and some some seasons we, you know, we, it's not so good, and and that you have to still put it up and and yeah. su- suck your thumb, kind of thing, or suck on I something mean, he's else. Getting, presumably, he's getting paid for it. You know. Oh so yeah, of course. I mean, what what would you know? What the employers should say? Well, look, you know, at the end of the day, you're not successful. We're gonna relinquish your services or you know we're going to carry on paying you but you've got to be accountable but it's like saying well, let, let's forget about all the previous times when you've lost your money people following him and start again that's dreadful and that that's completely contrary to the responsible gambling message it's like the punter that knocks his bollocks out and says oh well we'll forget yesterday let's start again you know let, let's rip up or delete all the records and, and, and start fresh you know that that's just lying to yourself isn't it well, I think any I'm... profit, any profit he makes now, you know, you have to take into account the previous losses. But he's not now, and I bet you, if he shows a profit from this point on, he'll be trumpeting at you know thirty points up. Well, he's not thirty points up, is he? He's thirty points less than the the amount that he's decided to delete. Yeah, it's a bit unsavoury. Like I said, I don't know his reasons. I don't know. I, I don't really really follow him that much. But to me, accountability is everything. I think you know in everything you do because. I mean, it'd be like me saying, oh, I bet for a living. Oh, do you? Right. Well, show, show me your profit and loss then. And it's like me just saying, uh, well, I'm losing really. And that's that's the thing. You've got to, you've got to show you, your wares if you like to match your status, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's like the, the punter's sort of response to how you're going or just about breaking even. Now, that can mean just about breaking even or or I'm on the verge of bankruptcy. No, nobody admits to, to really knocking it out, you know, a lot of the time. You do, I do. But a lot of people, I'm, getting, I'm just about level. You know, how many points have you had? Oh, I only had a couple. Well, you know, I had 15. So, so you know, it's kind of like that, isn't it? You're lying to yourself because the results are published. You can see them for what they are, but he's asking people to, to, you know, kind of to forget fact. And I think that's just a really odd thing to do. But as I say, I don't, it doesn't bother me and I, I don't know his reasons, but it's a really bad take, I think. Mm. John, you love TC, of course, but what's your take on that? Uh, I mean, no, see, I, mean, I, I don't like the man. I read the column in question where he, he reset the, the dial, so to speak. I thought he was being fairly honest about it. He said it was playing on his mind because mm. he does bet the ones he puts up and he puts them up in good faith. He said it was affecting his confidence, his judgment, which we all know it can do, can't it? You know what I mean? Yep. If, you have a, if you're having a bad run, you end up betting frightened and frightened when he wins now. We know that. I don't personally have a problem with it because it doesn't really matter to me how any tipsters do in over a period of time. You know, I, I don't really care. You know, and if, that, if someone wants to follow him, they we're all adults, they should take that into account with his race at. But if it improves things for him and his followers, good enough. Yeah, I'm struggling to find a concrete reason why anyone would follow Calvin in, in terms of ability or punted ability. I mean, we need to see backgrounds here. The guy's got a big interest in rugby. He's, you know, obviously probably got more expertise in that than racing. But racing, he was a PR man for Betfair. I don't see what he brings to the table when you're tipping two days before races, right? So you've got the cherry pick of the prices. You've got you've literally got the absolute cherry on the top on these. So you, the fact he's doing it in when you're cherry picking, Jesus Christ! I find that astonishing that anyone's doing it in two days before. As as bar stewards, we expect look at look at our show. We're doing what we're doing thirty percent more than thirty percent uh, this season tipping the night before, 
and I'm yeah. not saying we do that every year, but the point is we know that that's not possible to achieve, say, if you're t- tipping on the date. So what I find amazing that Tony's that far behind tipping two days before where he's literally got first access to... As soon as the price has come out, he's on with an article, puts the price out, and he's, he's got the literally the best odds that anyone could possibly obtain at any point. So, which obviously most people... I find that rather astounding from, from Calvin, really, personally, but I don't care enough to be bothered about it. But I've had a few emails on that, asking me to comment on that, so that, that's fair enough. I, I have done that. We'll move on. Going to the television, John, Chris, this weekend, the stark contrast between ITV and NBC in terms of betting content and previews. Both shows had the stories, but NBC literally was totally different class, in my view, on the betting content. John, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know how it works over there in America with NBC, the subscription channel that aren't standalone or anything like that. I, I don't know. What I do know is that certainly MCI TV coverage that the betting content was light years in front of what I yeah. What I find found amazing was the fact that they were even doing like bank rolls um, in terms of how, how they're all doing on the weekend. Yeah, you know, I, mean, so. I, I, th- I think the problem is, though, I think. The BHA have a hand in this approach from our terrestrial channels. And I, th- I, th- I think the steer in this comes from the BHA wanting this angle where the, they want every, everything geared towards the novice, the people that just go to get pissed and all, all the yeah. rest of it, you know? Yeah. If, if the people that control American race were faced with a presentation like that, They'd say, no, nah, you can get fucked with that. We're, we're not interested. We're a serious sport. Yeah. But I think the BHA stay at what we see on terrestrial telly. So- yeah, they, they, they create the culture, the atmosphere. You know, whilst it might, it's kind of, whilst it's not probably a direct edict, you know, they've created an environment where it's all about all about the story, all about the, the, the kind of the, the attracting the novice punter. And, and it's been done exclusively to the detriment of the people that, that are already invested in the sport and already fund it because they are, you know, regular recreational gamblers. And we'll touch on that later, I'm sure, with this, you know, this petition. That I, I, I mean, we, 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 we criticise jobs for the boys and that. But yeah. when you think about it, the people on the ITV racing team that's in front of the camera are all racing people. Yep. I am sure that they would rather do what NBC do. If you, Probably, if you, yeah. you know, if you ask them what they want to do, what their ideal program output would be. But there's somebody with the hand on the tiller, my money's on the BHA, that's steering that coverage. That well, you direction. see, you see the marketing initiatives, uh, John and Lee. It's all about. <laughs> getting new people into the sport you know and, but, yeah. and you can understand that i mean that's but that's a very superficial marketing strategy be, because at the end of the day the quickest bang for your buck is, is to try and attract people from a different demographic you talk about you try and get them betting yeah. short termism isn't it because yeah. you're yeah. only going to get the it it's a Ponzi scheme, you know. You keep getting new yeah. people in all the time, but eventually you run out of new people, and that, that's yeah. where Ponzi schemes collapse. They're fine when you're attracting new money. You know, if you want to do that, go and you know market to people that, that are members of the National Trust or, or the RHS, people who've got a few quid, retired, got time on their hands, and you market it as a, as a as a good day out, a social event, and you can have a few quid on. You know, the grey pound. That's where, you know, you should be spending your marketing money if you want to get new people in. Kids, you know, people under 40, just not interested. They've got no time. They're busy. They've got kids, etc. You only have time to, to study and to, to follow the sport and attend it when you're retired or your kids have grown up. But that's reality. It's always been an older person's sport. Golf club bores, Chris. Golf club <laughs> bores. And for, it, it, no, it is. It's kind of the Masonic Lodge stuff. You know, the only people that can go to, to Masonic meetings, you know, every day of the week are retired people or people that, you know, don't have a lot of other commitments. So therefore, for them, you know, that kind of activity is a hobby. And, you know, you can imagine racing, you can bring the wife along and bring, you know, bring your kids along, whatever. Look at the pictures of winning connections for syndicates. They are all almost exclusively white middle-aged people. 
that, that that's the sort of people that gets involved in syndicates. Well, they're the people you've got to get. John, when we met Ed Chamberlain at York, it was interesting to hear him say, I, I, I believe what he says, but and he said that if they tailored the programme around betting, they'd have no one watching it. I'm just wondering, actually, because funnily enough, when, when we start this conversation, that what, that meeting wasn't particularly in my head, but when it did pop into my head, I was thinking, well, ITV are up against... What was the American race on two subscription channels last night? Was it on that, the races and racing TV? Yes. They're up against two specialist racing channels. Now, I would imagine people that have the specialist racing channels aren't going to have a bar of ITV anywhere. No, that's true. What are NBC up against? Are they up against the specialist racing channel or were they exclusive in America? Exclusive. Yeah, you say ITV again. It's it's limiting what they can do, really, isn't it? Because they're not going to compete with racing TV. Because if you paid your subscription for racing TV, I don't care what you're going to watch that. That, that. that is fair comment. That is actually fair comment. I mean, but all the time ITV are left. They're playing sweeper, aren't they? I'll have a confession to make. I rarely watch ITV. Only time when I do is when. There are split screens on racing TV, and it's an ITV race, and I'm not playing in running. I just want to watch the race, like in full screen. I, 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 I watch the races on Betfair Live. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, it's it's, it's kind of if I want to see it in HD and stuff, I watch ITV when when because racing TV split screens are fucking dire, and so, so, so that's that. Right, uh, we move on to a very important subject. That is certainly taking over a lot of, lot of our lives at the moment, affordability. And the development this week was a petition, which was set about, I believe, I can't say this was a fact, don't want to get in trouble, by the Jockey Club and the BHA as an initiative to sign this petition against affordability checks to be able to bet on racing. Now, I am fully behind this. There's 68,000 signatures so far. I'm not being negative, you know, just for the sake of anything like that. They could have done it maybe before now, but they've chosen it now. Okay, that's fine. There's lots of accounts gone by the wayside uh, in terms of Betfair accounts, bookmaker accounts, as these bookmakers really are taking the piss in terms of fleecing people, withholding money, not paying out money until you give them a photo who's stood in front of your house with a big cheesy grin. Bank statements. If you've had a payment sent into your bank account from a friend, they want their driving licence and ID. I'm telling you, this is serious. So this petition, whilst I'm behind it, and I, I think it's a good thing, I'd like to be a bit critical of it first because... Chris and John, what did this basically do? It showed all the media in their speedos, didn't it? First and foremost, I think it's an absolute waste of time, personally. And yeah. you know, I, I take a slightly different view, Lee. I think, I think it's, I'm negative. I, I'm against it. I think it's an absolute waste of time. I think that ship has sailed uh, because of the ineptitude of those in racing who are meant to be custodians of the sport. But what it showed is that the utter contempt that people in racing and the media without exception have for punters right because the punters have been subject to this for a long time and it's only when you know racing's rulers decree that you know this is a good thing that the media and people in racing suddenly jump to attention and, and, and push it i think it's a waste of time and all this notion oh if we get a hundred thousand be debated in parliament well there's no guarantee of that and what debate you're going to get three o'clock in the morning with two mps who are asleep the ship sailed the only way these this regime will be unraveled is if big corp turn around and say crikey we're losing money here people are not betting anymore or they're going to the black market but, you know, it, 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 people in racing, this says to me that people in racing would, would be perfectly happy for the sport to continue as it is, but with punters not being able to bet. It's only because their own livelihoods, are, you know, are potentially affected. That they've jumped aboard. And, you know, J James Knight made a point and said sort of, you know, which I half agree. With, he was critical of people who said, like us, that, you know, it's two years too late. And, you know, he, his point was, well, you know, even if it had been launched two years ago, you know, only the diehards would be interested. That, that is true. But our point is that the people in charge should have initiated this two years ago so that people in racing would have jumped aboard. You know, the fact that they haven't, you know, is a, is a damning indictment of their of their ability. And, you know, it will fail. And I, and I think it, it just tells you everything you need to know about what the people think about punters. And it's not very good. Very good rant. And I agree with nearly all of that. So 
Coming on to this, obviously all the presenters, Leona Mayer, Lydia Islop, they all went for it they, across the board. Kevin Blake's just done it. But what I did notice was of all the people to have retweeted this petition was a distinct lack of flutter people retweeting this. Kevin Blake, the only one to my knowledge. Vanessa Binney Ryle hasn't. Matt Chapman hasn't. Nick Luck hasn't. I'm not saying he's flutter, but that he's, he's the big surprise, really. I thought he would have. So the big two, really, Nick Luck and Matt Chapman, I haven't posted this petition. I haven't noticed, to be honest. I, I, I haven't took that much note. I, I just noticed there's no. a lot of people that's in the racing media have. I mean, I have to be honest, but, I didn't really look to see who I but, but, but it's But it's interesting, isn't it? It's only when their livelihoods are under threat, and that's the media, as much as people in racing, that they get interested. You know, as I say, they would have been perfectly happy for this. If the sport could, could continue and they could draw salaries and no one could have a bet, right, they wouldn't give a shit. And that well, tells you what they think about punters. Yeah, I mean, you can go, you can go back, like, two, two years on Twitter and what have you, and there was like three people banging on about this. There was Lee, yep. Can Berry, and Jeff Banks. Correct. And, and and no one was interested because, you know, they don't enjoy the status and credibility. You know, racing, as we've always said, is a feudal system. It's hierarchical. You know, ultimately, if the likes of Gosden, Henderson, and the BHA say, you must sign this, then everyone jumps to attention. And, you know, that I get, I get that. I understand that. That's not my problem. The, my problem is, is that the BHA and, and, and the media should have seen this iceberg on the horizon two years ago. They should have seen it. And the fact yeah, that they didn't yeah. or ignored it, that's my problem. Negligent. So let's come on to the BHA again. And on the 2nd of November, this article flew under my radar. I only read it today. It was, uh, what, was three days ago. And Joe Salmer Smith, he's welcomed the minister's words that a new frictionless system would change things for the better. This is the BHA chair. This is what Chris said about the petition when he said it'll do no good. I'll agree with Chris, and I'll tell you why it'll do no good. Because the same words will be uttered in Parliament, so you'll get to 100,000, everyone will get excited. Oh, we can get a debate, we can get a debate in Parliament. The debate will be, we assure horse racing that the checks will be frictionless. They'll bang the same drum and the same mantra. Tell me how these checks so far have been frictionless. They aren't frictionless and they will not be frictionless because bookmakers are mining data. We are not looking in the right direction here. The Gambling Commission is proceeding ahead as planned. Big Corp could stop this in a matter of strides. It's simple. They could just say, no, we're not doing it. What are the Gambling Commission going to do? We're not doing it. We'll take you to court. We'll say it's unlawful on data collection. Mm. You'll have to rethink. Right? There's lots of ways that they can stop this. And the fact that I've got happily going along with it, and I've got evidence. See, evidence is key. Evidence is key when you bet. Evidence is key when you do anything in life. You act on that evidence. I've got a leaked email here from, it's like a Bond villain, isn't it? Camilla Toogood. <laughs> That's her name. Senior Public Affairs Manager at Flutter UK, right? This is how the email finishes to an MP. I'm privy to this. I'm going to say it. I don't care. We appreciate that the industry has not always got it right, which is why we are keen to use the white paper as a reset moment. Please do let me know if you... Like be... Tony Calvin, that, isn't it? Reset yep. moment. Please do let me know if you would be free at all over the coming weeks. If you find it helpful, we could also arrange for you to visit a shop in the constituency so you get an insight of how we operate firsthand. Right? Mm -hmm. They want it. Do you see the wording? The earlier spiel was all about safer gambling, but the finish was they've not got it right. It's a reset moment. So they're resetting and they're happy to do so. The only reason they're happy to do so is because the data is worth fortunes to them, which is why they keep asking punters that have got money trapped in accounts, can't get it out, why they're asking them to jump through all the hoops while holding the passport, the driving license, eating the dinner with a wife and brother stood next to them all smiling, with all documents shown next to the house number. They are behaving horrifically. And this kind of behaviour 
cannot be condoned. So when they give sound bites, and when you've got the BHHS uh, clapping like a seal, saying, I welcome these checks as soon as possible. As soon as possible. That was his words. Right, frictionless checks. It is not frictionless. What kind of stupid are these people? The fact that lots of people have lost their accounts already and that turnover's gone down, and they think now that this petition is going to be the be-all, and it's not. It's done. It's finished. Like Chris said, it's done. That's it. It's bolted. It's gone. And this is what annoys me. They all sit there thinking they're doing a grand job and patting themselves on the back, when in fact they have made the biggest bollocks of the industry ever in my lifetime. We, we've had it, unfortunately. I mean, so I've seen it firsthand there with particular documentation. So coming on to Greg Swift, who the BHA appointed last year in, in, a, in a big sort of whoa, statement, look at who we've got. We've got Liz Truss's right-hand man, this, that, and the other, right? Could have gotten the letters. Liz Truss were going into number 10 at the time. How was he a key ally to Liz Truss? This was the Racing Post interview, right, when she was happy for him to fuck off to the BHA. So that's your key ally. Oh, I'm going to be here, cheer. Okay, fair enough. Julie Arrington described Greg as we are delighted to be able to attract someone of Greg's calibre to this role. Among Greg's responsibilities, we'll be leading the sports liaison with lobbying of government and senior figures in the national media. That's gone well, Greg. Well, I was going to say, how did that work out? Yeah, that's gone well. You're doing well here, mate. The depth of his government contacts and political and media communications experience will be a great asset to the BHA and the sport. I have seen nothing from this man, absolutely nothing. This is a man and an organisation that's allowed themselves to be fobbed off by DCMS officials whose main interest is gambling harm. And if you want further evidence of this, that it gets better, right? The Gamble Aware Conference on the 6th of December, 2023. Go and go for some turkey, John. You know, let's all go down for a dinner. Opening remarks from the Baroness Kate Lampard. The keynote is the Right Honourable Stuart Andrew MP, Minister for Gambling. He's there, yes, giving a speech. We're just the turkeys, aren't we, for Christmas? This is the best shit of all, and Chris will like this one. Right, so panel discussion. Moderator. Get ready, Chris. Drum roll. Go on, I'm... Rob Davis, The Guardian. To provide the opening remarks and a balanced outside perspective of the future based on his own reflections and observations. Tremendous. (laughs) Tremendous. Look, if you're all listening to this, guys, you're all listening now thinking that we're saying this petition's going to help. It's not. We're fucked. We're fucked. I'll post the link if you want on Bastards. But honestly, the, the people that are turning up here, the one that's got the best clue here is the Shadow Minister for Gambling, believe it or not. You'd always make Labour to bring the safety in rather than yeah. the Tories. But Stephanie Peacock actually gets the game because she actually sees some of this for what it is. But honestly, this is a it's not gamble aware conference on the sixth of December. It's grift aware. The NHS yeah. are there. Everyone's oh, there with geez. they're ready, yeah. they're ready. Gamblers are the turkeys. It's like saying, Well, how would you like to be cooked? Yeah, that, 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 that's kind of all they're asking. You know, the, the ship sailed, it's finished, it's done. You know, only only some sort of paradigm shift, that's a good word, isn't it, will cause this to unravel. Something that nobody can anticipate. You know, it's going to happen and it will happen. No one are on punter's side. For example, the BGC, no. who are basically represent the industry. Got all their albums, they're good, yeah. Like- Welcome the Gambling Commission taking on yes. seven new commissioners yeah. on £295 a day. Yeah. Again, none of them with no gambling experience. We don't. No, that's good. No, we don't need anyone with the experience. No. We don't want no. No, no. no. It does come from the same mindset, isn't it? The, the, the operating premise is gambling is a bad thing. Now sort it out. No one is prepared to accept that you know gambling may provide enjoyment, safe enjoyment for millions of people in the UK. That, that's my big beef with it all. You know, it's saying it's it's definitely bad. All gambling, no matter what it is, it's bad, except stock market, share trading, and the national lottery, which is yeah. just a bit of fun, isn't it? Well, the exchange is the same product as, <laughs> as what the CFDs are on, on IG, which is basically, mm. if I don't fancy the dollar against the pound, I put a stake on per tick and say, well, I think the pound goes up to against the dollar. And then you leave it and it goes up or down on your day and you take your profit yeah. or you lost. No, it's the same. Out. no, no, I can put in 25 grand on a credit card and that's fact. I can post that online if, if anyone doubts that. Again, it's classist and it's a grift. It's a massive grift. Let's not paint this in any other direction. It is a grift. 
And unfortunately, we are in a perpetual cycle of doom in terms of different organisations like the BHA, like the Gambling Commission, like Big Corp. Do not take your eye off Big Corp. If you want to solve this, don't bet with Big Corp. Do not bet with them. Withdraw your funds, finish with them. Yeah, go with the smaller firms or go with black market. Just do not bet with big firms. They don't give you a bog anymore. The twats, they're keeping your money. They want your data. It's all bent. And and that's that. That's all you need to know. Forget what happens anywhere else. That That's a fact. And we're, and we're all fucked. We'll move on to something else. What do we think, chaps, to Chapman advertising MC Yeehaw bet? And being a, being a presenter on ITV, and is this fair game? I, I just want your opinions. I mean, is that the, op- the optics are terrible? Aren't they? I think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just opportunism, isn't it? You know, I don't criticize him; he wants to get a few quid, but bloody no. hell, you know, Christ, it, it, it just looks terrible, doesn't it? Really yeah. terrible. It's obviously I, I don't know who who's backing that MC Yeehaw bet or Yeehaw bet skin. But obviously, it's a major bookmaker or whatever that's backing him, or or maybe an independent bookmaker that's backing him. But someone's backing him. Obviously, he hasn't got the he hasn't got the scratch to pay out on on winnings and stuff like that. It's pretty, I, I would say, cheesy is the right word. And just just like you say, optics terrible. John, your thoughts? Well, somewhere, some sometime there'll be a BMW showroom that has an orange Beamer that needs liberating. So. <laughs> Yeah, you absolutely. Know, you, might, you might need a few quid. Tom Weeks has been on. Are the Cotties returning? They will be in some format, but obviously not last year's because, to be honest, we don't want pylons. I'm not comfortable with pylons, etc. So we'll we'll decide a, maybe a voting format, maybe privately. or I don't know. I don't know. I, I just don't want pylons. Like I, got, I got the format wrong last year. I thought it would be fun, but it kind of turned out to get a bit nasty. So we will be doing it. I, I know what my three are. It's it's quite obvious. It picks itself. Andrew John Rhodes is top because obviously he, he's a narcissist and for what he's doing to the sport and he's not interested. He's not interested in facts. Number two would be Julie Harrington for the stewarding of our sport. They're the most important ones. They're terrible. And three would be Calvin because for his disgraceful Take take it down of his profits, and I know it upsets John. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the cotties will, the cotties will be back, and we'll, we'll work out a format that suits that maybe doesn't in so offensive. It doesn't result in litigation. That's well, the well, there is that. Right, Andrew John Rose might hate the word narcissist to him. Apologies, Andrew. Right, <laughs> John, I saw some interest in your questions today regarding Top Cat. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where's that come from? As in. You've obviously picked a random, well, famous cartoon, if you like, from back in the day. We talked about rent a ghost last week. I was, I was channel hopping in the week, and there was an episode of, well, well it was advertised as Boss Cat. All right. And the song is Top Cat. It's Top Cat, yeah. So I'm thinking, well, what the fuck's going on here? And sure enough, our listeners, um, we, we can find anything out if we put the question to them, can't we? Apparently, the show was supposed to be called Top Cat, but they had to change it to Boss Cat because there was a cat song called Top Cat. Ah, interesting. But the theme tune says Top Cat, doesn't it? Close yeah. friends get to call in TC, providing it's with dignity. Correct. What well, Racing's uh, About podcast has been on and said his version of the lyrics is Top Cat, the most susceptible Top Cat, Who's in to let you all those close friends calling TC pro fighting? It's Workington T. Workington no. T is fantastic, <laughs> isn't it? No. I remember seeing an episode of Swap Shop, right? Noel Edmund said emphatically it's providing it's with dignity. Yeah, that's that's definitely the, the lyric. Yeah. Yeah, pro fighting. Right. I think Pro-fighting Cheggers it, confirmed it, it. this on a later episode of Cheggers. Correct. Oh. Yeah, he was yeah. pissed at the time though when he said it. Talking about swap shop, then, Chris. Did you ever send anything in? Well, I swapped my my, my parents' house for a train set, so uh, <laughs> that 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 kind of set the tone for the rest of my life. But yeah, it was uh, yeah brilliant. I, I used to love swap shop. Actually, really did enjoy it. Yeah, fantastic. I, I, I sent him asking if I could swap anything for one of them big, thick magic markers that Noel used to rate the swaps down with. And that started my <laughs> cycle of um, 
<laughs> well, it's, it's a past thing, though, isn't it? You know, posher kids used to watch Swap Shop. Your bows used to watch Tiz Was on the other side. You know, that, yeah. that was the, that's the de- definition of class. I, I, I watched Tiz Was, Phantom Flam for yeah, Fling. Your bows, oh, you? oh, yeah. In your bows. Yeah. You get a Sally James and all that. Bob Carroll G, Spit the Dog. Yeah. Oh, spit the Sally Dog. Uh, Sally James. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what great days. That's... Especially like when they chuck water bucket over. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit weird, isn't it? <laughs> Swap Shop was much more, it was kind of organised mayhem. Much yeah. nicer than fucking Tiz was. Right, so going back to Top Cat then, obviously the gang and everything, I, I was looking at the characters and remembering them. Uh-huh. I would say John is Benny the Bull because... <laughs> because Jesus. That's, that's no, no. Doberman from um, Milko, you know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, Sergeant Doberman. Yes, on Milko. Yeah, Dwayne Doberman. Because he because he was lo- he was lo- he was loyal to TC. He was yeah. like he's, he's right hand man. This that, and the other. I saw Johnny that. He's a bit thick though as well, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw I saw TC in you. Uh, not T. Uh, Choo Choo in you, Chris. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was fancy Chooch, Spook, Benny the Bull, wasn't it? Those, Bra- those were the characters. Yeah, and, and, Bra- and Brain. Yes, could you? No, you, not anymore. Fucking don't hell. you remember Brain? Brain yeah, was, uh, Brain yes, was that's what right. got him. Yeah, that's right. He basically gave the game away to Officer Dibble every time. The grass, when they yeah. <laughs> Would you say Officer Dibble's like a, a good candidate now for like being at Met Police? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, probably. It's kind of like Yogi Bear when it was the, the Park Ranger. That kind of whole Hanna Barbera theme was, you know, like lovable rogues against it, authority. It's quite. Yeah, cool. he, he always has his truncheon out, didn't he? It was never under wrap. Yeah, yeah, he fucking didn't mess around, did he? Yeah, he was good. I used to enjoy that. Hand every time he enters yeah. the back alley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <well. laughs> that, that was the ITV version. Yeah. I watched BBC, yeah. yeah. Chris, was Anna Barbera doing Air Bear Bunch? Yes. yes. I used to love Air Bear Bunch. Yeah. Captain Caveman, remember that? From the Teen Angels? Yeah. Zowie! Zowie yeah, like Cavey! Sort of, yeah, hot fucking birds and some bloke with a massive beard. Yeah, it was bizarre. Yeah, they've yeah. got these birds in like short mini skirts and big long <laughs> fuck me boots with, with a big airy character, you know. And he used to do it if you used to give him a kiss, brother. wasn't it? That was it. You'd have given him a kiss and he'd sort of greet and sort of beat someone up. <laughs> he was like he was a victim of abuse, I think. Coercion. What a way to finish. Right, I think I think that's about wrapped up. Yeah, uh that that's been a good show. Enjoyed it, chaps, John and Chris. So we hope we've got some things off our chest there. Certainly we have. Not that it'll make any difference, but we hope you enjoy listening. That provides enough entertainment for you on your Sunday evenings and Monday morning dog walks. That's all from us. Bye for now.